Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour, bienvenue à cette euh, cinquième séance des petits déjeuners du court métrage. Ce matin, euh, j'invite pour débuter la séance la réalisatrice de Symbiosis, Nadia Andrasev. Good morning. In English or in French? Please, in English. I'm so sorry, I don't speak French. Okay. <laughs> Nadia Symbiosis tells the story of a woman who is cheated on. Tell me about the origin of this idea to have her in a sort of symbiosis with uh, her husband's mistress. Mistresses. It, this is a personal story for me, so there was a time when I realized that um, I was constantly thinking about some women, and they were a very important part of my life, even if I didn't want them to be an important part of my life. It was like an accidental collection of, of women, so I felt that um, I was in some kind of symbiosis with them, but also the title, if you are referring to the title, it's also kind of like a strange symbiosis between the husband and the woman, so it refers to both, both of these relationships. At, at the same time, we really feel it in your film that, uh, that we are alone, that all the characters in the movie have a strong, uh, a strong feeling of loneliness, and something that uh, make it very obvious is the the place of the masturbation in the in the film, because there is a, a scene where uh, there is basically two scenes where there is masturbation in the film. So, uh, tell tell us about the uh, your conception of, of loneliness through the film? My, <clears throat> my conception was that um, I felt that many times when even if you are in a relationship you feel very lonely and you depend on you depend on one person for some reason and you don't want to depend on them but they uh, maybe they take away your sexuality because uh, you don't supposed to cheat on them but uh, but you cannot have enough sexual experience with them if they don't want to. So it's, um, I felt it's important to show that uh, many people can be lonely even if they seem to be in a, uh, from the outside uh, in a happy relationship. And it's just like, even if in a big city we walk around people who, even though they are surrounded by many people, they, they can totally, they can be lonely and uh, they can find uh, a connection in other kind of relationships, I think. Your film was made in co-production co between, uh, uh, with friends. So tell us about the, this co-production and the way uh, the work was, uh, was uh, divided between the, the different countries. Okay, so <coughs> I started de developing this film with a Hungarian company called Salto, but uh, I was in uh, Animation Sans Frontier at the time, um, and I, which is a workshop between four countries, and the final stage was in Paris. It was a pitch, and the uh, Miu Productions um, saw the pitch, and they were interested in it, so and I was actually in ANSI uh, three years ago with my graduation film, but that's when Miu Production and Salto started to make this uh, relationship. And, um, and basically we got, um, so it was not only the Hungarian funding, but we received um, French funding as well and from the Rhône-Alpes region, region. So I, um, I actually spent time in Valence um, working on the animation and um, 
I was working with uh, Salto in Valence, no, sorry, Miu Productions in, in Valence. Yes, and also from France Television. So I'm just extremely happy to be here because uh, this is so nostalgic for me that uh, the film was made in this region and I just feel it's uh, perfect that uh, the world premiere is here because I'm just so grateful for Does France. <laughs> Yes, it was uh, this week. It was the world premiere because the film was uh, completed very, very recently. <laughs> when we we watched it during during the selection process, we really we we can felt it was something strong, but it was still hard to uh, to imagine the, f the the final result. Uh, when we watched it, when it was completed, uh, I realized how complex and mature was the film. And it, we, we talked about that and it's, it was a, a real surprise for us that such a young filmmaker, because we've selected your uh, graduation film uh, three years ago, such a young filmmaker did something so, so major and, and, and so complex. So. Uh, Tell tell us about the the way you uh, you develop the project and and the script writing because it's uh, it's incredibly coherent even if it's not absolutely linear uh, the film so uh, tell us about that. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, this is a great compliment. But um, I uh, I had this <coughs> original idea of a woman with a collection of women. A uh, long time ago, actually, it was just this one idea. And, um, and then, so the story idea was mine, but I was working on the script with uh, my, my story editor from my previous film, Rita Domoni. And um, this was the, I think for me, this was the most difficult part because I had this uh, idea for the film and you know, everybody found it interesting. But to make an actual film out of that was really difficult. And it was also because it's a personal project, a very important topic. I, I was struggling with, uh, with writing it. So she was helping me put, put down ideas in a kind of like a collection. So basically, I was just uh, writing down all my uh, like scene ideas or just um, some sentences and then we, we pieced it together from that and it changed over the time and I think this for me it's important to make films where during the film making it evolves into a something else so it becomes it has its own life like an animal or <laughs> you know that's that's how I made it so I didn't know exactly how it was gonna be at the beginning of course <laughs> Some questions from the audience for Nadia Andrasev. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the process of taking this story and turning it into something <coughs> visual and if that was a storyboarding process or be just because the way that this, this really complex story that could almost be written like in short story form was told almost all visually um, was so n nuanced and, and well done. So I was wondering in how was that, how, what was that process? Thank you. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I was parallel working on the script and the, and the storyboard because some of the scenes uh, were actually just quick ideas, uh, like the sushi and the mirror and all of that. It was an, an early, early storyboard that I actually had to make for, um, for to get funding. So it was just uh, like a quick storyboard and then it stayed in the film and some of these, some of the ideas came like that, that um, I drew something and, and I had this, I had an idea and then it stayed and some other ideas I took I took away, but basically I was trying to work on the story and the visuals parallel because I think it's important in anime. I think it's important in animation to think in a visual way. It's, of course. 
One last question for Nadia. Yep, Martin. I wanted to ask about that process of compartmentalization that you had in the film. Um, it seemed like it was a research project being developed by the character so that she was was uh, taking notes and, and as, as if it were for a graduate thesis or a book publication. Um, but are we to read that symbolically though as some in, instead just compartmentalizing it internally to like make a symbolic choice of lifestyle? I, <clears throat> I, when the original idea came to me that uh, a woman is collecting other women, I, <coughs> I thought this is a way to deal with a situation when she can distance herself, but also like by collecting things, I think that uh, she's controlling the situation. And uh, for me, that was important to show that um, you can start to become obsessed about uh, something and, and make a hobby out of it or, a, or a, something that you'd like make a collection and like that um, you categorize everything and just uh, do this scientific process so you are not really over like dramatic about it but you can actually become um, happy to find a new piece and excited and driven by this uh, by this collection obsession i don't know if this ex uh, answers your question sorry it just seemed to be a little bit hard to rec rec reconcile the uh the scenes of um, touching the rug, you know, and um, that seemed much more personal and much more about her own lifestyle and her own choice. Um, um, and it just, I'm just, just trying to understand like whether she was trying to just use this sort of process of logic to like sort like what her life choices would be and sort of in conflict with the, the tactility of the rug. I, well, I think she's, uh, she's also trying to, co she's comparing herself as well. So this personal uh, experience that she's touching everything and she's feeling and tasting and hearing, it's, uh, it's making her involved but also distant. I don't know. Thank you very <laughs> much, Nadia Andrasev. Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, j'invite à me rejoindre Bastien Duprier, le réalisateur de Sous la canopée. Bonjour Bastien. Bonjour. Bastien, historiquement, les, les animateurs qui ont travaillé en, en gravure et en dessin sur pellicule ont tendance à travailler avec de la musique préexistante. C'est notamment le cas euh, de Stephen Volotion, que vous connaissez bien. Euh, or, vous collaborez avec Antoine Zuccarelli, qui, je crois, signe ici une musique originale. Euh, C'est ça. Et en fait, je n'avais pas du tout envie de démarrer sur une musique. Et je n'avais pas envie que la musique, euh, disons que le film et l'image soient dépendants de la musique. Et c'est pour ça que j'ai d'abord travaillé l'image et la structure du film, indépendamment de la musique, mais tout en y réfléchissant. Et après, il y a un jeu d'aller-retour entre la musique et l'image sans cesse. Et, et qu'est-ce que ça permet, justement, le fait de ne pas euh, travailler sur la musique Est-ce que ça fait en sorte que, plutôt que de se concentrer sur, euh, sur le rythme, on, on se concentre davantage sur euh, des éléments narratifs, à ce moment-là J'avais n'avais pas envie de, que, le, que la musique conditionne la structure du film donc j'ai d'abord pensé à la structure du film okay. et d'abord aux images. Et euh, j'ai pensé le film en fait comme quatre grands tableaux. Et euh, j'ai produit pas mal d'images pour chaque partie que j'ai ensuite envoyé à Antoine. Lui a fait des propositions, moi j'avais des idées, des idées précises et ça s'est construit comme ça. Et, et vous avez remonté les, les parties ou pas il y, a, il y a du montage dans le film, oui euh, Du montage sonore, oui, et du montage mais, pour l'image. Mais du montage pour l'image, oui. Oui, oui, il y en a coupé, beaucoup ça. aussi, oui. oui. Il y a des parties où c'est vraiment là où je suis revenu sur la musique, donc j'ai animé sur le son, et des parties où c'est lui qui est venu se coller à l'image. Donc un véritable travail de collaboration et d'aller-retour, vraiment. Oui. Alors, euh, pourquoi, pourquoi, ce thème, pourquoi ce thème écologiste En fait, quand j'ai vu le film la première fois, ça m'a 
vite rappeler que les oiseaux, par exemple, comptent parmi les motifs favoris de, de McLaren. Mais j'ai aussi fini par penser à Frédéric Bach, qui, dans un, une toute autre esthétique et, et un tout autre environnement technique. Donc, pourquoi ce thème à la base, le sujet m'a été inspiré des oiseaux du paradis. C'est des oiseaux qu'on trouve en, dans le sud-est asiatique, en Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée. Oui. Et c'est des oiseaux qui font des parades vraiment très rigolotes dans tous les sens. C'est des, des oiseaux très colorés. Et donc l'idée est venue de là, de ces oiseaux qui ont des chants très particuliers, qui bougent dans tous les sens. Et je me suis dit, j'ai envie de faire quelque chose là-dessus. Donc c'est euh, extrêmement... Euh nourrissant pour créer du mouvement, ces parades, justement. C'est exactement ça. Et au-delà de ça, j'avais envie d'essayer de, de raconter quelque chose avec euh, l'abstrait, en apportant quelques éléments figuratifs. Et ça, c'est mon côté un peu écolo, je pense, mm -hmm. <rire> de parler de la déforestation, du moins de l'évoquer en la suggérant par des, des éléments clés euh, dans le film. Et j'ai conscience que on puisse approcher le film de deux manières différentes, soit d'une manière plutôt contemplative, c'est-à-dire par les sens qu'on voit, ce qu'on écoute, et une, une approche plutôt autour de la problématique de la déforestation. Vous, euh, vous avez été en compétition, Bastien, pour la première fois ici, avec un film euh, qui était conceptuel formellement, mais ce n'était pas... Je me souviens plus en quelle année exactement, c'était en... En 2015, En je 2015. Crois. Et euh, depuis, donc... Vous vous êtes consacré à, à ces techniques directement sur la pellicule Il ben, y a quelque chose que j'aime vraiment beaucoup là-dedans, c'est de travailler sur un format qui est très très petit et qui révèle beaucoup de choses une fois sur un écran, immensément grand, toutes les, les petites particules, des poussières. Et pour moi, ça révèle vraiment un côté euh, organique, euh, concret, qu'on peut toucher. Et c'est vraiment quelque chose qui me plaît à travailler en tout cas. Et, et, et est-ce que vous souhaitez... Euh poursuivre dans cette voie parce qu'il y a assez peu de cinéastes qui ont travaillé directement sur la pellicule sur une très très longue période. Même McLaren, ça s'est produit dans une période de sa vie assez restreinte. Steven Voloshan est le contre-exemple bon, qui euh, euh, a peut-être la, la filmographie euh, la plus imposante qui ait jamais eu directement sur la pellicule. Dans, dans votre cas, est-ce que vous vous projetez dans cette technique j'ai envie de réessayer pas mal de choses sur la pellicule, mais j'ai aussi envie d'essayer d'autres choses, mais en gardant à l'esprit le côté petit qui devient grand. Okay. <rire> Il y a quelque chose qui, qui m'attire vraiment là-dedans. <rire> et, et la tension entre euh, l'abstraction et le, et le narratif, c'est un jeu qui vous intéresse beaucoup, le fait que par moment, on est justement dans, dans un environnement qui est euh, purement audiovisuel, c'est-à-dire des... Des, des couleurs qui bougent, des, des lignes, des formes qui bougent et des sons. Et par d'autres moments, on peut justement rentrer dans, dans le récit, dans une histoire. Bah, à ma connaissance, je ne connais pas de nombreux courts-métrages abstraits qui évoquent un, un sujet de fond ou du moins où on sent vraiment une narration qui va d'un point A à un point B. Et là, j'avais envie un peu d'essayer ça. Je ne sais pas si c'est réussi, mais en tout cas, ouais, j'ai envie de l'essayer, d'aller de, de un peu plus loin là-dedans encore. En fait, dans votre film précédent, euh, qui se déroulait dans un vélodrome, euh, euh, on avait là, euh, je dirais, un cadre qui déterminait vraiment le, le début de l'histoire, la fin de l'histoire, qui était la course, et un espace qui était clairement prédéterminé. On dirait que là, vous vous risquez davantage avec Sous la canapé. C'est vrai qu'avec le film précédent, Aerobie, là, c'était un cycliste qui faisait un kilomètre sur une piste. Donc, mon idée, c'était vraiment d'être à la place du cycliste... Euh d'être dans son corps, de ressentir la respiration et de travailler sur la ligne et la courbe. Et là, j'avais envie d'essayer de tenter à quelque chose d'un peu plus compliqué, plus ouais. complexe. Mais je suis convaincu qu'il y a encore beaucoup de choses à faire dans l'abstrait et en mêlant avec un peu de narration. Des questions de la salle On n'a quand même pas épuisé le sujet, déjà. Bastien Duprier, merci beaucoup. Merci. And now, the director of Lola, la patate vivante, Leonid Schmelkov.
You know, Nick, the, the obvious question. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good yeah. morning. The obvious question w uh, with your film is did you have an imaginary friend? We're doing an experimental film here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so did you have an imaginary friend when you were young? No. <laughs> Real friends, it was better. <laughs> no, good for you. <laughs> good for me, <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe a little bit, but um, not. I just imagine this story. So tell me about the origin of this story, the, the, the way you... Uh, what was at the... What was the sparkle? What was at, at the origin of... Uh, uh, how it started? Story? Yeah. The idea. I just uh, played with my daughter with this restaurant things. She made some tasty, tasty plate with uh, some stones and some shit. And, uh, uh, and she said, oh, please eat here in my restaurant. I said, wow, super. And what is the name of the restaurant? And she said, this is the title of the film. And I, I thought, oh, m maybe it might be a good film about the girl with the restaurant and such such games, uh, go games, uh, with the restaurant, with the coiffure. Mm -hmm. so and you, you didn't give her a credit for original idea? I gave her. But you gave her? Yes, yes, some money for, for, the <laughs> <laughs> for the idea and for, for, how do you say, for the voice. Uh, for a voice? For a voice, yes. Of course, she, she wants more, but I said, if when you will be a star, you can ask me for more. But, <laughs> but now it's just 20 euro. <laughs> <laughs> like Nadia Indrasev, your film, li like and uh, Nadia Indrasev's film, your film was a co production with friends, mm -hmm. too. Uh, tell us about the, the, the way it became uh, a co production. Oh, my Russian producer just met uh, some good guys here in Ansi several years ago, and they said maybe we can do it together, and we tried, and it happens, it happened. So it was interesting for me because it was for the first time co-production I never tried before, and it was productive, good. I feel happy. So wha why, when you say it was productive, why, why do you feel like that? Yeah. Oh, because we share some works. Uh, they help, you know, my French friends help me with the residence, with uh, some techniques. For example, in Russia, we rarely do this etalonage. It mm -hmm. was for the first time. I, never, I, I didn't know that there is etalonage. And so it was interesting for me. Most of the film we we saw from Russia in the recent years are uh, folkloric tales, or uh, th th there was a lot of films like that that were produced. So your film is a, a very personal and contemporary uh, uh, contemporary stories. Mm -hmm. Is it is it hard to uh, to find? Funding and to to uh, find enthusiasm for that that kind of film in Russia these days. Uh, maybe easy. No, I don't know. Yeah, of course, it's much more easy. But the same thing in France. If you have some films for ch children, it's easier and easy to sell it. And of course, if you do something personal, it's. Like, okay, we give you some money, but <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> but uh, n not so hard. I got some money for the next film now, also very bizarre. Okay. So According to you, if, if you have to, to tell me the theme of your film, what I uh, just one thing, uh, what, is, what would it be? Uh, the team of your film. A ah, team. Yeah. My dream team, or for this. No, film? the the the. <laughs> the theme. 
Team. Ah, the team. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. For, for, for this film? Or for, for, the, for this film. If you have to resume this ah. in one sentence, what would it be? Uh, it's like a film for my daughter when she grow older, when she will be 30 for her, like a present. Okay. Understand? Yep. <laughs> Question from the audience for Leonid Schmelkov. Yep. I see a stylistic and visual similarities to Maurice Sendak. I'm wondering if th that illustrator was an influence in um, both in sort of the rebellious nature of the children and also the visual style. Do you know? Unfortunately, I didn't see. I, it was um, for visual. I worked with uh, pictures of uh, Gagin. Uh, how in, 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 in English, I don't know, Paul Gagin. Gagin, yes. I just downloaded his pictures and uh, redrew it in, you know, for my house. And that, is, that an, is that an illustrator? Gagin, Paul Gagin? <laughs> oh, I don't know the pronunciation in French or English. In Russian, it's Paul Gagin, the painter from 19th century. I okay. just downloaded from the site of Metropolitan Museum some pictures yeah. and um, Redo, re, reworked it in Photoshop. Uh, so th this was my style for this film. Thank you. Another question in the back. Uh, I, I really felt that uh, relationships between characters are very convincing. I never had any relationships with, with my grandfather uh, also I didn't have uh, siblings but I I felt it's very real and convincing and it felt like it's made based on I know your childhood you had such kind of really relationship with your siblings. grandparents or you were spending holidays in such way because this all these details of house like some objects in the backgrounds, like they felt like, or very well researched, or just taken taken from from memories. Uh, thank you for the question. I like your film too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the the house was like the my my house in the childhood. We, we sold it when I was young. Uh, we call it dacha. Do you know? Yes, yep. dacha, dacha country yep. house and. But um, the relationships uh, a little bit like my childhood, but I'm mixing, mixing my childhood and my neighbor's childhood, some mixing, 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 and trying to do something that interesting. But of course, some films are my films, some films from my daughter, from my... <coughs> oh, yes. It's difficult. One last question for Leonid Schmelkov. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And now please welcome Natalia Mirzoyan, réalisatrice, director of A 5 Minutes de la Mer. Good morning, Natalia. Good morning. Natalia, de depending on whether you are a little girl, a fly, or an old man, five minutes does not mean the same thing. So the subject of your film seems to be the, the relativity of time. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. And. Uh, why did you did did you pick this subject? Uh, I'm really interested in about time and its rela uh, relativity. I I, wrote, uh, I read a lot of books and especially uh, now uh, while uh, while I was starting with film, I had very mm, small daughter and she was growing up like whoosh, like you know very fast. Uh, so it was really surprising. It was f for me first time when I became mama. 
and I felt like time becomes, uh, I, I felt time in a real different way, and I was starting thinking about time a lot. And the idea of the fly in the film, it's something very, very strong in the film, the, the way you, you recreate the point of view of the fly, and uh, so tell me about that. Point of view of the fly? Yeah. Uh, you mean this fly? You, yeah, I, I mean the, 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 the little insect. Ah, insect. The, the fact we look. Ah, yes, it's just I, I, I need to, to do a connection with, within real time and uh, slow time. And I thought what it will be through this fly, which, which was we, we see that it is fast and then it is slow. But it's not uh, from uh, view of the fly. It's from the view of the girl. It's from the view of the girl. Ah, ah okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand okay. it. And uh, you, you told me about your uh, uh, about your daughter, but did you refer to your own childhood in the film? Uh, no, because uh, it wasn't my story, because uh, when I was a child, uh, it was not seen in Armenia, I was grown up in Armenia, and um, uh, for me, I was just drawing at the seaside when with my little daughter, and uh, then I uh, was trying to connect with drawings. Uh, my, uh, my one of my friends just said that uh, it is her uh, memory from childhood, uh, this conflict uh, within her and her mama. And I thought that it is good conflict to connect with drawings. And uh, so it's, it's not my, um, uh, it is the story which is some way personal because of course uh, mama is something forbidden to me. And, uh, and I also forbid uh, something to my daughter, and it's all always some conflicts. So, but uh, it wasn't my story. Of five minutes now. Okay. <laughs> Questions from the audience for Natalia Mirzoyan. Yep. You do a wonderful job with the gestures, particularly of this couple. Um, conveying so much about their relationship. And uh, I, I mostly just wanted to say that's wonderful that these slow movements that they have really give you this sense of, of their connection. Um, and then he dives down under the water and becomes the fish. Just beautiful transformations. Maybe talk a little bit about how you came up with those ideas of when to show something very human and when to do a, a metaphor. So uh, this couple, uh, I saw them in real life. Uh, this scene when she was uh, fluttering uh, her husband with water, uh, and it was very touching for me because it was on, on the real beach, uh, what I saw and just draw. And I have very old parents, uh, and for me, uh, this old, you know, couple is very. Mm, uh, personal, because my, my father died uh, already during this, when I met this film, and he was 93. So for me, it's a personal moment, yes. And I wanted to connect childhood and old age with together. Another question? Yep. Um, thank you so much for this beautiful film. I, I think it's a, a masterpiece. And I'm just wondering if you have something in your film you think you don't like it or you think you make something wrong? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm really very happy that uh, people uh, like my film because we, I say, well, we don't see a lot of mistakes. and <laughs> It was really hard for me to do this film because I had a very little daughter. And she was always saying, Mama, play with me, Mama. <laughs> and when she was asleep, I was trying to animate it. <laughs> so it was really hard time for me, but I couldn't stop. I don't know why. I hope it will not be again, this experience. <laughs> of 
So uh, it was a lot of things that I couldn't do. I'm not very happy with sound. I'm not very happy with something that I couldn't do. It uh, a lot of things now I see and so well I should do. But I c but uh, in any case I say okay I'm I'm really okay because I made this film with a very little child, uh, little child on my hands. So it is quite hard. So in any case I'm okay. <laughs> One last question for. Natalia. Um, I was just wondering how you deal with the technique of the film. How did you process um, with the technique of that film? Oh, okay, I have, I have some um, papers with me and if you want I can show you. So it was all drawn with markers on the paper on uh, this uh, it's special paper which we found on factory. It's very thin but very glossy. And uh, my friends, uh, I had two friends and me, we had very small queue of animators. <laughs> Actually, they helped me to, to draw it. And yeah, we draw it frame by frame. <laughs> it's, it is crazy. <laughs> it's a very, very beautiful film. I really liked it. Thank you. <laughs> Natalia Mirzoyan, thank you very much. Thank you. Maintenant, j'invite à me rejoindre Osman Serfon, réalisateur de « Je sors acheter des cigarettes ». Bonjour. Bonjour. Osman, votre film est à la fois très drôle et profondément mélancolique. Y a-t-il un espoir pour cette famille <rire> euh, bah, moi, je pense que la, la fin reste ouverte. Ouais. Euh, oui, y a, bah, y a, pour moi, il y a un espoir, mais euh, c'est pas obligatoirement. Euh, pour le coup, je laisse vraiment le spectateur décider, de, en tout cas en ce qui concerne le personnage principal. Euh, c'est vrai qu'un peu plus pessimiste euh, en ce qui concerne la sœur. Ouais. Et la mère, bah, on ne sait pas, elle est quand même un peu plus en retrait. Euh, donc, euh, ouais, c'est pas vrai. Parlez-nous parlez des fantômes du père qui hante la maison, parce que c'est une idée qui est très forte et, et, et mmh. incongrue et surprenante. Donc, ces, ces hommes qui se retrouvent euh, un peu partout dans les armoires, euh, dans le, mmh. le lave-linge. Euh, bah, en, en fait... Disons que c'est une sorte de matérialisation, en tout cas par l'image. Du manque ou de... Ben, de, de, du fait que c'est un personnage qui, connaît, qui, qui ne connaît pas son père. En plus de ne pas l'avoir, de, de manquer, il, ne, il ne le connaît pas, il ne connaît pas son image. Et, et en fait, ça rend la, en fait, le fait de ne pas le connaître, ça, le rend possible, ça lui donne possiblement toutes les formes imaginables. Ouais. Et donc, ça, en fait, ça parle de l'omniprésence de l'absence. En gros, c'est ça, c'est-à-dire le sujet, le sujet du film. Et euh, pour moi, il, en effet, c'est une projection du personnage principal, mais je les considère euh, comme ayant une, une, ré, une réalité, euh, bah, une réalité physiquement, ils sont là quand même. C'est-à-dire qu'on les traverse pas. C'est-à-dire qu'ils ils peuvent avoir une interaction ouais, ouais. avec le monde physique. Si je parle pas dans le micro, faut me le dire, parce que <rire> je sais que je suis spécialiste pour oublier. Mais vous, vous me dites, ouais, c'est la présence de l'absence, c'est peut-être ça l'idée du film. Est-ce que c'était l'intention de départ Est-ce que vous souhaitiez faire un film là-dessus ou ça s'est concrétisé au fur et à mesure Non, non, non j'avais euh, même, même l'idée de, 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 de genre dans des placards euh, avant. Ok. Mais il y avait des choses très décousues, j'avais même quelques scènes, même pas mal de scènes euh, du film qui me trottaient déjà en tête euh, et que j'arrivais pas à assembler. Et euh, ben c'est un jour euh, avec euh, Emmanuel Arenal, qui est mon producteur, où je lui parle de, de qui insiste un petit peu genre hein, quand est-ce que j'aimerais bien produire ton prochain film Quand est-ce que je dis j'ai des embryons de choses, mais c'est très c'est très fouillé. Et il m'a dit est-ce que tu as essayé de je sais pas de choisir un point de vue, euh, d'écrire du point de vue d'un des personnages par exemple. Euh, l'enfant, le, le jeune, et au départ je ne voulais pas, parce qu'en général ce n'est pas le genre de film que j'aime, 
Euh, je me suis dit, ah, ça va être un truc initiatique. Euh... Et puis, bah, euh, je me suis quand même prêté au jeu en me disant, euh, quitte à revenir sur un autre personnage ou euh, à choisir plusieurs points de vue ensuite, mais si ça peut m'aider. En fait, j'ai écrit le synopsis euh, détaillé en quelques heures. Enfin, en, en, pas, en, pas en une journée complète, mais en deux fois, trois, trois heures. Et j'avais déjà la, une structure qui est très proche du, du scénario définitif. Après, il y a beaucoup de travail euh, d'ajustement sur, sur des, des choses, enfin, sur, sur des, des points précis et beaucoup d'aller-retour. Mais, euh, mais en fait, je savais vraiment où j'allais. En fait. Je l'ai écrit euh, de manière assez limpide. Il y, a, il y a quelque chose qui est étonnant dans le film aussi, c'est l'espèce de, pratiquement de naturalisme des, des dialogues quand entre la sœur et le frère, euh, mmh. on s'engueule par exemple, mmh. où on a l'impression tout à coup de, que ça sort d'un nos amours depuis à l'heure, je ne sais pas quoi, il y a, il y a quelque chose de très, très, de très naturel dans, dans la mmh. manière dont, dont c'est joué et dont c'est écrit justement. Et en plus, c'est un peu. Euh, J'avais déjà fait des dialogues, mais sur d'autres types de projets qui étaient. Mais, euh, mais c'est pas quelque chose que j'ai fait beaucoup euh, euh, en animation. Mais je sais pas. Enfin, je les ai fait comme j'ai senti. En fait, j'ai pas écrit les personnages en disant hein, il est comme ci, comme ça. Je les, je les, je les ai plus ou moins sentis. Et euh, je, me, je me suis fait une idée mentale de ce qu'étaient ces personnages avec des références de, à la fois d'amis, euh, enfin surtout pour la sœur, parce que je n'ai pas de sœur, j'ai grandi sans, sans frère et sœur. Donc euh, je, je me suis rappelé mes, mes, mes copines de lycée, de collège. Et puis euh, en gros, je me suis dit, ben voilà, quand, je travaille en général un petit peu comme tel, tel personnage a ces propriétés-là, sans forcément les coucher sur papier et les arrêter, mais disons que ce que j'imagine du personnage, tel, tel autre hein, a ces, ces propriétés-là, et si l'un dit ça, comment il réagit En fait, c'est presque de la physique pour moi. Mais... Et puis après, les, les, les dialogues, ça se, ça se lit, euh, ça, 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 ça se lit à voix haute, et puis ça s'écoute, et puis ça, il faut les jouer pour les entendre. Et après, j'ai aussi... Enfin... Euh, je les ai testés en voix maquette sur animatique et ensuite à l'enregistrement, on, on a fait le casting, on a fait un, un nouvel enregistrement. Et j'avais déjà repéré dans le script des parties où on pourrait éventuellement avoir des improvisations quand la sœur est au téléphone. Enfin, j'avais envie qu'il y ait une part d'improvisation dans, dans le film. C'était très cadré parce que le film était très écrit en fait. Euh, mais, euh, mais voilà, en fait, dès que j'ai pu trouver ces espaces-là, pour que les, 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 les comédiens puissent interagir et, et avoir quelque chose de naturel. C'est-à-dire que la, la scène devant le, où le, 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 le personnage principal veut récupérer ses cartes dans la chambre de sa mère le soir et qu'elle ne veut pas lui ouvrir, mmh. elle devait durer deux phrases au départ. Et euh, c'est un plan qui fait, qui, était, qui fait maintenant 30 secondes et que j'ai dû couper. Mais... Et pour la petite anecdote, à chaque fois qu'il... Qu dans le, dans, elle, le, pour, la comédienne avait pour consigne de ne pas le laisser rentrer et le petit était tellement fort en manipulation qu'à chaque, chaque prise elle finissait par elle le laisser rentrer, par le laisser rentrer. Ouais. <rire> donc j'ai dû après couper ouais. il, y a, il y a ce moment justement où euh, le, le fils il est dans la chambre de sa mère et là il découvre qu'il y a des, des artefacts du, du père quand même mm -hmm. et pour vous, c'est un moment pivot dans, dans l'écriture, dans, dans le film euh, bah, En effet, il y, y, y a une bascule. Et un truc, enfin, si on devait rapprocher ça d'une structure narrative euh, un peu classique, classique c'est oui, oui. que le, c est, c est, c est, c est, je pense le climax du film. Mais euh, enfin, pour moi, c'est même la fin, c'est la conclusion. Y a, après, le reste c'est un épilogue. Mais, euh, mais bah, euh, oui, disons que le personnage réalise quelque chose à ce moment-là, en effet. Mm -hmm. Je ne pas quoi vous dire de plus. Pour moi, ça... bon, après, je l'ai vu beaucoup de fois. Pour moi, pour moi, c'est évident. Enfin, je n'ai pas beaucoup de choses à ajouter par rapport à ça que, que, que ne dit le film. Ouais. Mais après, ah, sauf si vous avez une question plus précise sur. <rire> Des questions de la salle pour Osman Serfon. Oui, Madame ici devant. Bonjour. Euh, Bonjour. Je, en fait, en revoyant ce film, je me demande, je, je me demande pourquoi ce choix d'offrir ce film euh, dont l'histoire se passait dans cette petite famille, euh, des choses très quotidiennes, mais avec une, une musique tellement solennelle comme ça, cette entrée, c'était impressionnant. 
Pourquoi ce choix de musique de euh, alors, euh, bah pour, alors, pour, le, pour euh, Roméo et Juliette de Prokofiev, en fait, c'est les deux musiques que j'utilise dans le film, je les ai, je les ai mises au, au scénario en me disant on verra après. Et euh, ensuite, j'ai essayé à l'animatique et je fais bah, en fait, ça marche. Et, euh, et Roméo et Juliette, il y avait l'idée de. Alors. Déjà pour la force et euh, la, la puissance cinématographique euh, du premier, et puis il y a un certain décalage. Euh, parce que le, un, le film est un peu hybride au niveau du ton, et, euh, et je trouvais en, intéressant qu'il y ait un, un décalage entre une musique assez, assez dramatique et, et forte, et des, des choses assez triviales. Et. Euh, en, en, ouais, bah celui-là, c'est. Je sais pas, enfin, moi la première fois que je l'ai entendu. Euh, je suis dans une bibliothèque en train de, de choisir des CD et euh, je ne connaissais pas du tout. J'ai mis vachement de temps à retrouver ce que c'était. Ah ouais ouais, ouais. Et, euh, et non, il, il m'avait vraiment frappé. En fait, c est, c est plus, là, pour le coup, c'est plus pour la sensation. C'est comme on est. Enfin, il y a un. Y a un je ne sais, sais pas comment décrire euh, l'état dans lequel il me met. C'est un peu tôt en plus. Mais, mais, et puis, il y avait un côté aussi symbolique de la, de la musique. Bon, il y a. Le premier, c'est Roméo et Juliette. C'est un peu d'histoire d'amour impossible. Je t'abatte ma terre de Pergolet, c'est un peu de musique de deuil. Donc, euh, voilà. Michael C'est quelque chose de flottant, en fait. Le je t'abatte ma terre. Enfin, je ne l'ai pas, pas utilisé dans, dans le but de, de faire quelque chose de larmoyant ou quoi. Mais c'était vraiment plutôt, euh, c'était plutôt pour une question d'atmosphère et de et d'état. Enfin, ça amène une, ça amène une ça... intériorisation. Hein, voilà. Et bah, exactement. Ouais. Merci. <rire> C'est gentil. <rire> Hi, there are um, altered René Magritte paintings on the walls everywhere, um, and they're altered in a rather funny way, um, but. Uh, Each of them seems to deal with a male figure who is obscured and anonymous, um, which we would expect with Magritte. But I love the way you would just change an orange for an apple or a, um, a childhood, like um, uh, hands behind the head. You know, that wouldn't be in the original Magritte, but but you know, you've you've switched them. So I was wondering, first of all. Um, How did you arrive at that idea of creating like a theme for the decoration of the set um, in a way that would parallel the absence of the father? And secondly, who in this household has the sophistication to be collecting Magritte and who hey, it's for production and be, and be <laughs> It's not real Magritte. <laughs> uh, no, I know, I know they're not real. Yeah, Magritte, yeah. Actually, but, but it implies that someone in this house understands the surreal mm. nature of the family and its dysfunction. Yeah, but uh, Margaret is uh, kind of popular. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I think it, you don't have to be uh, that uh, over-educated to, <laughs> to know about it, but sure, it's like if you see the rest of the apartment and the furniture, it doesn't seem like we are in a... Like, Like culture-oriented family, but uh, I think I didn't. That's what one of the things I didn't consider so much in the point of view of the characters. Like basically all the set, and and uh, I, I really wanted to. I wasn't expecting to be that much present and uh, that much uh, pointed by the uh, the viewer, the viewers. So for me. But actually, it does, and maybe it's a mistake to have chosen Margaret. But uh, and it, it's not only Margaret. I, I just wanted to have a rep representation that with without faces, and uh, that even the set talks about like it's a, it's maybe some sometimes. I, I was planning to do it more unconsciously for the viewers, but it's too obvious. So because I, I got often the, the remark about the, the Margaret's painting paintings, but uh, and. I, I didn't choose specially Magritte at the beginning, but it happened. It appears that he's, he's done a lot of paintings with, uh, of like figures turning back to the to the to the viewers. Or like, actually, if you it look, it seemed to me like a really good choice. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a very good choice to me, but I. You know. I don't know, but <laughs> that's not only Magritte with. Uh, 
when when a Woody Allen movie, uh, you're gonna make uh, handsome and and like a beautiful stranger. I don't uh, I don't a remember. Tall, a tall something. Uh, hmm? A tall stranger. I don't remember. Yeah. Tall dark stranger. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, I wanted uh, an, icon uh, an, an iconography that <laughs> like, like really recalls, qui rappelle l'inconnu en fait, that makes you think about the unknown. <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Osman Serfon. <laughs> And now, please welcome the director of Live a Little. Jenny Jokela. Good morning, Jenny. Last time you, you came here, it was with your student film? Yeah, it was last year with my film called Barbecue. And you received a crystal for it? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Tell, tell me about the, the technique of your film. Because it was, when, when, when I saw Barbecue, it was fascinating the way you, you moved in a, in a big picture, basically. And now it's, it looks something different, but it, the, the, the way you, you move, the way the drawing, uh, the, the, the The metamorphosis, or it's it's very uh, organic, and so tell me about the way you you imagine the movement. And um, so in this film, because I worked here with uh, with a writer Celia Hill, who's right there, uh, so I was able to play off her words a bit more freely. Because in barbecue there was no voiceover or no text, mm -hmm. so there I was more. Uh, expressing the feeling through the metamorphosis, which I am doing here, but I felt because there's a voiceover, I was able to do it even freer mm -hmm. uh, and use more cuts to show, like these short clips of an emotion, like a tiger jumping or being scratched. Uh, but I feel like I played off the language a lot more in this film compared to the last one. Do you, do you work in, uh, in large or in small format? <laughs> Uh, this one was painted on A5. Okay. Uh, the last one was on A4, so I've, I've learned to draw a little bit smaller for this film. <laughs> And do you think it makes a difference at uh, when we look at it on screen, the fact you, you work on a smaller uh, format this time? No, I think for this one it was, it was completely fine. Like I was, it was just about uh, being able to paint the small details and... Uh, I developed a little bit in a year, so I was able to start okay. using smaller, smaller brushes. Mm -hmm. So you, you worked, as you said, in collaboration with a writer. Uh, was that an idea you had together, or her original idea, or yours? Yeah, so uh, we went to school together. We met like over 10 years ago, and we've been saying for ages that one day we're going to do this film together. Uh, And uh, sorry, you you do you say you said uh, one day we will gonna do this film and not a film. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if maybe Celia could be better at explaining like how the idea came up because I feel like it is from a lot of discussions we've had over the years. But in the end, it was it was her writing where I based everything on. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, It was something new for you to work with the writing of, of somebody else, and it gives you the the opportunity to uh, to have your images as a commentary or to complete what we hear in the film. Uh, so, do you end up with with a script that also uh, include the images or? Uh, the images came uh, um, it when was you a animate? Uh, it was a little bit both ways. So originally the text I got was quite a bit longer. Uh, and because we only have so much budget, so we, we knew the film has to be quite short. So we had to edit it down quite a bit. But a lot of the visuals 
are inspired by the text that we had to cut away. So we kept a little bit of, of both. And what what was your your intention with with this film? Because it's it's uh, there is a strong feminist content mm. in it. So it was clear for you that it was uh, you want to say something about uh, uh, about a personal feeling or, or or something more general in the in 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 women's condition. Yeah, the idea was to almost make it as a visual poem and uh, about a woman, but especially about young women who maybe feel like they don't really fit into the common idea of what a woman should act like or behave like mm -hmm. and act a little bit too much and they make mistakes, but they keep going and are kind of their own biggest cheerleader in a way. So that was the idea that we just wanted to make uh, a film that encourages um, younger women. Mm -hmm. Th there is something that I like very much in the film. It's the the questions with the same answers, like uh, three times. It is is it something that you end up at the end, or, or it was in the script? That was in the script. That was in the script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for you, it. It was uh, it was humorous when you, w when you did that clearly. Yeah. For me, it's a really funny film. But then other yep. people told me it's dark. But I thought yeah. I was making a, a comedy when I made it. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was it was a little bit a theme in in today's program because yeah. if you look at Osman Serfon's film, it's uh, or at uh, Leonid uh, Schmelkov films, or even at Nadia Andreessen's film. It's films that are at the same time funny but uh, dark or, or, or tragic or sad or melancholic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was uh, our intention when, when we built this program. And uh, I noticed that s some people consider your film as, as something very violent or aggressive even. How do you... How do you... Uh, how do you receive that? I guess it's the part where this guy is harassing her and she hits him back. Maybe is that the no? It's the it's the whole yeah. it's it's the whole aesthetic. I mm. think the fact it's uh, uh, it's it's a sh very short film. Uh, the colors are 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 there. There is a like the tiger, as yeah. you said. So uh, the editing is v very short with uh, short uh, shots. Mm. And uh, some people told me it's, uh, I, 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 it would have been hard for me to have two minutes more of that. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about that? Well, I think it's, it's good because then it means also that the emotion of the film comes through. And so much of Live a Little is about visualizing the feelings of someone who feels very strongly. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I kind of like that to hear that in a way, because then I feel they've experienced the feeling of the character that in the film. Okay. Yeah. Questions from the audience? <laughs> ah, no, there you are. Was this film, um, uh, was there anything that you, uh, it, it, it was very coherent, right? But very, very short and sort of self-contained. So I'm wondering, were, was there, were there parts that you cut, that you, that you removed to make it sort of a, a tighter narrative? Um, or did it just sort of come as this piece? You know what I mean? Because there's a sense of maybe there's something left out, something that could be included, but, but, but it's there, it's just not right there. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like I said, the text was a lot longer, like yeah. it would have been not a feature film, but almost, if we had kept it all. So the verb, we did the editing down of the text quite in a really early stage, so there wasn't, okay. uh, from the storyboard stage, it was already what it is now. 
Another question? No, no. Okay, are you sure there's no other question? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Jenny. And now, please welcome Lucia Merziliak and Morten Tsinakov, directors of a demonstration of billions in four acts. <laughs> Sorry, Lucia, for the way I pronounce your last name. <laughs> That's all right, I'm used to it. Nobody, no, <laughs> nobody can say it. Nobody can say it. So, so please say it. Merziak. Merziak. Oh, it's sorry. quite normal in Croatia, but everywhere I go, people break their tongue. <laughs> but it's, it's easier to repeat after you than read it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw your film in some other festivals bev before uh, NSC, uh, fest b before the selection uh, process in NEC, and then this week at the festival. And every time I watch it, I have a very strong feeling of a dream. And because some parts are very precise, but it's very hard to put all, everything is precise basically, but it's very hard for me to put everything in order in my, in my head. Uh, so at the origin of the film, Did you had a dream or something like that? I don't know. It was supposed to be a surreal film. And in surreal stories or films or dreams, you have to... You, you, of course, nothing is like in reality. Uh -huh. And uh, it works somehow like a jigsaw puzzle that if you want to make some... If you, that you would want to see it again to put pieces together. You want to say something? Well, I would say that it was... Mm, kind of, yeah, it started with small stories mm -hmm. that were kind of like, do you know Daniel Harms? He's no. a r Russian writer, kind of surreal. He wrote those very short surreal stories. Okay. And we kind of started <coughs> kind of similar stories and then tried to connect them. So it's not dreams, but it's kind of uh, Harms-like stories. Okay. D did you wrote the script together? Uh, no. No? So, uh, how, how did you begin to collaborate in this film? Uh, basically straight after the script. Uh, okay. As soon as it got to, I guess, storyboarding, then we started to... Okay. And who wrote the script? Me. You? Okay. And... Uh, how did you did did you uh, uh, the in your collaboration when, when when you did the films? So, who did what? What was your arrangement to to work together? It was your first co-direction together, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, from basically when we started to work together, we were really uh, dividing everything and talking about everything. So. From when we had started to make the designs and layouts, we were drawing together and discussing every movement, every scene. And the animation was done basically 90%, 95% maybe, just two of us. And, or, or, okay, 80. 80. <laughs> we had some help towards we the have, end. We have a deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now when I look at the film, I don't remember if I animated the scene or Morten because we we were working together and somehow we tried to really imitate each other to, to have the same style. So, so basically we discussed every, uh, every stage. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so basically you, you, you discuss everything and tell, tell us about the way you, uh, you work the, with the soundtrack of the film. Well, we had quite an interesting person who made the music for
for the film. And the animation was already done. It was there. And uh, Kaspar, Kaspar Jansis, probably you know him, his he's animation he's director. He's also an, uh, 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 a filmmaker, yeah. Yes. And uh, we started to meet with him and talk about the music. And uh, we came to his flat and we were trying different things. Uh, so he made the music for the film, so I think it affected the way we made the montage also. And uh, he also invented some instruments. It was really interesting to work with him. You want to say something? Well, he basically he played the banjo with without strings and he hit it with a flute. Okay. And, uh, and the bottle of palinka. <laughs> okay. And this is not a usual way to play neither the banjo or the flute. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience for Lucia and Martin? Yep, Thomas. Uh, I know it's a real movie and kind of flow of weird scenes, but. Uh, I was puzzled by this uh, repeating crowd of this men in gray shirts, like it, there is some backstory behind them, they uh, represent something, some concept or, you know. Uh, I guess just uh, normal people who want to be entertained. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Another question? Yep. Hello. Um, there were a lot of situations that I thought were funny. Uh, was it your intention to do comedy or did the surreal situation just happen to be funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, we both like surreal literature or films and dark humor. So this was somehow the middle point. So it can be a little bit um, grotesque, but hopefully also funny. Thank you very much, Martin, Lucia. Thank you. And now please welcome Claudius Gentinetta, director of Selfies. English or French? Uh, English. English. Yeah. Claudius, it's almost too obvious to make a film on on selfies. So, did you uh, did you hesitate at the beginning when you when you had the idea? Because uh, uh, I'm, I must tell you my my feeling, and I heard that from many other people when the. Uh, read the title, they said, oh, another thing on selfies. And finally, when they watch the film, you say, okay, there's something new in this. <laughs> so uh, uh, did you hesitate at the beginning? Because it's so trendy to, to have a comment on, on, on selfies that... Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you are right. Many, many films uh, with this topic. But uh, what is different, I'm, I, I am an outstanding person. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not involved in it. Uh, and I watch as an adult to my kids how they do it. And I'm just wondering why. Uh, I can ask you, how many pictures do you have from your uh, teenager? If you was a teenager, how many pictures do you have? When I was a teenager? Yeah. Less than 10, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I have 14 and two are omit with faces. So that's a big difference for us two. We had this time without uh, internet, without all this stuff, so. Mm. Basically, so when I was a teenager, uh, I really avoid to see yeah, my me, picture. Me too, we are, uh, you, yeah, but I'm not good looking, so it was obvious, uh, uh, yeah. please do not make pictures about <laughs> me. <laughs> So this is very changing. Now the time is changing so quick. And uh, for me, it was very important uh, to do this movie because I thought to myself, someone have to do that um, in another way. 
because uh, my aim, my, my hope was to bring this short movie into the schools, uh, to the young audience, uh, to the youth people, because uh, as I hope they, they can start to have a discussion about it, what makes sense, wasn't, what, this, uh, what not makes sense, and I hope this film gives a big, short idea what can happen and uh, what is possible and what is not possible. Um, yes, and I made it for the yous, yous and uh, yeah, mo more than for us, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and, and did, did you succeed in showing your film to, to uh, young people? Yes, they like it very much. I, I get already awards from yous, juries. And the film will be now in school in Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, and I hope also in, in, in your country, because they need such stuff. And it's very different to the, to other films with this topic, I think. Uh, and it could help young person because there is always a competition between uh, all the selfies. I'm nice, you not. I uh, all the happiness around you all the time. Uh, we had it also, but not not so heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met some per person, some young girl, she's not so pretty and she was so happy to, to have this film because uh, she had some space in it to move and to breathe and to see, oh, okay, um, maybe, maybe it's not so important to, to do that. Uh, I was very happy to hear that because, yeah, that, that, there, there is a, it's, a, and it's also <laughs> not always, it's a bit dangerous sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because you get more likes if you have something dangerous behind you, <laughs> and uh, yeah, people already are dead because of this service. Yeah. Unbelievable, but it is. Yeah, in January I was in Switzerland at the festival of uh, Swiss cinema, the, the yearly festival of Swiss cinema. I saw it too, yeah. And there was an exhibition uh, on the Swiss animation that were made recently, and I saw drawings, I, I saw pictures, uh, stills from your films, your film, and uh, it, was, uh, it was like a discovery for me to, to look at these uh, drawings because there was so many details that I, I didn't see when I watch the film. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the way you, you work on, uh, on every frame ah, okay. for this uh, film. Maybe you have to film, to see the film twice, then uh, ah. to <laughs> see all the details, so that uh, the film will be, a, yeah, it, it gets better and better, I hope. Uh -huh. No, for me it was very important to, to have a very fast, um, cuts all the time because our time is very fast and so you can't see all the details but it doesn't matter because the young they can <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I made it like that so I, I was research all the selfies in the internet newspaper books selected and put it in folders bad very bad awful nice and uh, <laughs> try to find a story mm -hmm. in this collection folders yeah, I found to any topic selfies, unbelievable that people, uh, people in war and uh, you, uh, yeah, B millions of babies, and uh, then I, I we, we make some collage in in the Photoshop, so I mix it up with myself, with my daughter, my son, my mother, uh, uh, no, not my mother, not your but mother. some <laughs> all, all the friends <laughs> because of the copyright, and we print this collage out of paper and then we over. Painted uh, with uh, uh, water, water for um, wash, and scan again in the computer to the TV paint, and there I made the small animation piece because every self is a bit moving. So it, yeah, it was a lot of work to do all this over painting, but it was also really fun. It was like when I was a child in the school, give me some stuff, I will. Overpaint. Questions from the audience for Claudius Gentinetta. Thomas. Yep, Thomas. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, how you arrange the 
I mean, which, which, which scenes come first and next, I, I can see a certain development to the end, but at the beginning it seems you, you start with these migrant boats in the background and this is kind of, it looks like the, the, the starting point almost. Yeah. But yeah, this, yeah, it's an important question. Thank you so much. It was very, uh, th that was the really exciting for me to find how I can tell a story with this selfie. This co because selfies are very um, uh, interesting if you know the people there. If you know nobody on the selfies, it's not you who don't care about it. So uh, um, and re I realized very fast that I have a background and the background is very important in the film. So you c I can tell a story in the background. And because I found in every position in our life, selfies, uh, as a baby, as a, or in, every, uh, in, in the war, whatever you want. So uh, it was obvious to, to, to tell a story about our life. I, I want to start by, by, birth, by uh, delivery babies, so I tried to find another start. And it was sh for me clear it must be a, a, a nice starting, a slowly one with the feet and the beaches, and it gets worse and worse and and also by feet, but dead feet. This was just uh, a long, a bit a long way to find the, the right pictures after the next one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Claudius. Claudius. Voilà ce qui termine notre première session. Festival international du film d'animation d'Annecy.
Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue à cette sixième et dernière séance des petits-déj du cours, alors qui est consacrée à la sélection Animation of Limits. Sans plus tarder, j'invite à me rejoindre Thomas Reynolder, directeur de Don't Know What. Hello, Thomas. Good morning, Thomas. Thomas, there is many similarities between Don't Know What and Sunny Afternoon, your previous film. Do you consider these two films as parts of the same series, or do they are parts of a larger project? Um, they are connected, yep. of course, but the big difference of Don't Know What to Sunny Afternoon is that in Don't Know What I, I work based on the sound. So when I, and it's not a serial, it is the end of a serial. I have made three self-portrait films and this is the last one. And I will not appear in the next films as a main actor, so it's the last... If we call it a serial, it's the end it's of a It's kind of trilogy yeah, to you, yeah, yeah? Yeah, and it's done now. And I, I, I have seen myself enough on the screen, and <laughs> I will do a lot of films <laughs> in the future. I have a, a lot of ideas to do, and yeah. And the big difference between Sunny Afternoon and Don't Know What is that it's based on the... On the maybe I should say, talk a bit about the experience I had with yep. Sunny Afternoon. I got a lot of reactions, and it was shown at many festivals, also here. And I was fascinated by the fact that different audiences uh, react very differently, like cultural differences between Europe and America, for instance, but also there are different audiences who go to an animation festival or go an to an, an uh, experimental, experimental film project. program. And they like different things, and, uh, and I got a lot of comments on that, and I, I tried to develop more um, from this conversations uh, to, to build more and in fact um, yeah I'm, the idea was to make a, a film which um, can work in an animation festival but brings experimental um, uh, yeah to make an experimental film which works at animation festivals and then the other hand Um, yeah, to, to make a funny experimental film, let's say, let's put it like that. Yeah. The, the humor was uh, clearly something important f for you. The, the, the fact the film is, is funny, it's, uh, it's something that you wanted at the very beginning. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, th it was kind of a starting point, this question. Is it possible or is it acceptable for, for an uh, audience of of avant-garde films or experimental films to have humor. Uh, yeah, but even Michael that, Snow yeah. made uh, very funny or, films. Or, or how far can I go yeah. with that? And on the, yeah, it, it, was, it was a main, um, I mean, you have, to, you, as filmmaker, you have different motives to do a film, like personal ones, or you, you think, and I also want to entertain myself. So for me, it's, it's uh, I enjoy a lot. Uh, Well, I enjoyed a lot to work on the film and, and, and laugh about myself. So, in effect, it's also a film uh, in French, Le about The Joie de Vivre. Is this La Joie yeah. de Vivre. Yeah. Because uh, I'm very happy that I can use my voice and that I can uh, use my body. And this, this is also something the film expresses, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. So, you said the film was, the experimentation was based on sound. So yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, um, yes, the Sunny Afternoon film was only editing the picture and then I edit sound afterwards. And this, the next step I wanted to make is uh, I, I uh, try to find three sentences which could be good for sound editing. So what I did is single frame audio editing. So, and I was looking for two sentences, uh, three sentences and this I don't know what has a lot of vocals, and this um, I'm just experimenting has a lot of consonants. So this was a part of the idea, and it but it changed a lot. Then um, and what I did is I I had this sentence don't, I don't know what, and then I isolate the vocals and I, I cut them in little pieces and and play them forward, backward, and experiment how this sound uh, uh, 
changes and what is possible with single frame editing of the sound. So this was really the starting point. The, the starting point was mu to, to transfer language into music and to build a, compos build a musical composition. Yes. And the picture had to follow the, the discoveries in the sound. Mm. And then in the second step, I added more pictures or more images which, which I used for, for the reason of the picture, which, were, which had no sound. But the starting point was really sound editing. So you, you transform, transform a sentence or words in music, but you also are uh, transforming the filmmaker into a musician in the, in the film, because you, you work on, a, on music, you, 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 you are composing something. So do you have musical formation? Is this the first time you, you work uh, as a musician, let's say? No, I, I have a musical education, but just uh, for some reasons. Uh, I had many interests, like uh, for some reason I became a filmmaker, but I, ha I, yeah, I have learned the, the piano and the violin, and okay. I played the electric guitar when I was young, and uh, I played in a rock band and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, for some reason I, I, I got more interested in film and in visuals, but still, in all of my films, music is important, and sometimes I, I do it myself. Or yeah. okay. Questions from the audience for Thomas Reynolds. Seems you were quite clear, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, yep. I want to thank you for doing these interviews. It's very important, and it's it's a f it's great that to see that the film director is so interested in the films that he he really has a lot of good questions for for all of us. Thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. And now the director of Leaking Life, Shunseku Ayashi. Good morning. Uh, hello. Yes. Good morning. I, Shunsuku Ayashi, I discovered your work mm -hmm. with this film, and since then I saw uh, what you did previously, mm -hmm. and I would like to I would like to know if you uh, if you consider yourself as a as an animator, as a filmmaker, or more as a visual artist and mm -hmm. your film you where's the ideal place to to see your films mm -hmm. for you is it is it a museum is it a gallery or is it a film festival or a theater uh, so i started my i started my career as a painter so i I'd like to say, even I'm making film, but I want to say I'm making film as a painter. And uh, I'm, I think painting is my most important part. So, um, and after I, I studied in Goldsmiths, and I studied contemporary art in, in Goldsmiths University of London. And uh, at the time, I started making <coughs> experimental film. So, and then, like animation was my hobby, like making animation was a hobby since I was like 10 years old. Okay. So, but after I done experimental film and also my paint, I, I thought maybe I can make something intersection between the painting, experimental film and animation. So, yeah. But uh, I am not very good at talking uh, about my work and especially people who might not see my work. So I brought some of my painting here, Great. so maybe I just show it, because. Yeah. Because, uh, because I, I, I live in like very far away, like 14 hours from here, 14 hours 
by, by flight from here. So I couldn't bring Leo painting the because it's quite big. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I have a... Uh, if you want, I can yeah. Yeah. help you again. Oh, uh, sorry. This, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. This one is a painting from my film. Uh, in this film, and uh, the actual painting is bigger, but uh, all like stop motion painted frame by frame, and uh, and other. I and also, because uh, my painting is quite like some of them is a very huge, like some of them like ten meter wide. Mm -hmm. So I just want to show some of like other painting for. And like for show the scale. But this is a uh, like uh, like twenty percent. Like this is longer. Like even like the bigger, and also it's like ten meter wide. So it's still like a part of the painting. But so I like painting and uh, this one is also film and uh, all like stop motion painted. So I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we can see yeah. pictures of this painting on your website. Huh? You, yeah. yeah. So in real life uh, mm -hmm. dimension. Yeah. So yeah, so so it's. Uh, do you work with a, a collaborator at the camera, or you you, you work together when uh, alone when you? Uh, uh, no, because when you sh shoot the film. Because painting, like stop motion painting, takes like very long time. Like each day, take like I use like I I don't want people. If I, I just do it by myself, like even camera, mm -hmm. because uh, I don't want people to wait. Like I mean, I need like each frame take like 30 minutes to one hour and uh, take picture. But so people have to wait for one hour to uh -huh. take picture. So it, it, it's a long process. Yeah, so I just do it myself. It's easier for me, like more comfortable. Yeah, and, uh, and an artist like William Kentridge, mm -hmm. uh, he do exhibition where you can look at his films and drawings are also in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. so do, you, do you do that kind of thing? Or? Uh, I, I want to. That you is uh, my, like, my, like, my, like, my dream. Mm -hmm. So like, when I started this, this kind of uh, work, I always thinking about how to show my work in like, art space. And uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe next year is I will. Okay. Question for Shunseku Ayashi from the audience. Yes, Tamek Papakul. I'm not sure I wanted to make more precise image about the this stop motion painting you use. Like uh, you paint on one painting and you like photograph like next uh, stages of this process of painting that or you have really like i know <laughs> hundred of these huge paintings I, I i don't think so yeah uh, so because the process each each scene the process is different so some of them are like i like frame by frame on on the one single image and other times i just i make um like hundred drawings, but I also like uh, like the um, I like the relation between painting and film. Like painting, like the f when I paint, like you can see the time, like passage of time on painting, and there you can see that the process through when you're watching the film. So I like this uh, uh, relation between painting and film. So. 
most of my film, mo most of my like process is uh, I I make like like uh, huge canvas first, and uh, I just do stop motion painting on the canvas. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shunsaku Ayashi. It was a pleasure to have you this morning. Maintenant, j'invite Pierre Hébert, réalisateur de « Mais un oiseau ne chantait pas, but one bird sang not ». Bonjour, Pierre. Bonjour, Marcel. Alors, Pierre, parlez-nous de, de votre collaboration avec Malcolm Goldstein, qui est un, 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 un musicien, un violoniste assez célèbre et euh, assez âgé maintenant. Donc, pour ce film, euh, euh, comment avez-vous travaillé avec lui? Euh, bah, mon histoire avec Malcolm est assez particulière parce que euh, Malcolm est d'origine américaine où il a travaillé avec John Cage, avec euh, Arnold Coleman, avec plein de musiciens très connus. Et il est venu à Montréal euh, au début des années 90. Et m'avait-on dit, puis moi, il me l'a confirmé, qu'une des premières choses qu'il a vues à Montréal, c'est une des performances que je faisais et que ça l'avait beaucoup frappé. Alors, bien qu'il euh, circulait parmi des musiciens avec qui je travaillais, que je connaissais bien, je ne l'ai pas rencontré pendant toutes ces années où j'aurais dû le rencontrer, euh, le croiser plusieurs cinq, fois. Ouais. Plusieurs ouais. fois. Et c'était qu'il y a deux ou trois ans que finalement, j'ai décidé euh, d'aller euh, le voir. Euh, D'une part, par intérêt pour sa musique, mais aussi parce que euh, alors que j'avais été un peu obsédé avant de vouloir travailler avec des gens plus jeunes que moi, ce qui devenait de plus en plus facile, devenant plus âgé. <rire> euh, je me suis dit, bon, il faudrait peut-être que je travaille avec des artistes plus vieux qui continuent sur une voie très radicale et euh, très engagée dans, le, dans leur art, non pas euh, comme un truc de fin de vie, mais comme un truc toujours actif. Et Malcolm me semblait quelqu'un comme ça. Alors, je, 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 je l'ai rencontré, on a... On a on a constaté des, euh, des, des intérêts communs, des, 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 des orientations esthétiques communes et euh, ça, ça a entraîné une collaboration qui s'est déroulée sur deux films différents et ça correspondait en fait au moment où après 15 ans d'interruption, j'ai recommencé à graver la pellicule. Alors son travail avec moi était très très lié avec, euh, avec cette, cette chose-là. Alors pour euh, « Mais un oiseau ne chantait pas », euh, cette pièce, parce que le titre du film, c'est le titre d'une pièce musicale. Donc, ce n'est pas, pas le, un titre que, que vous avez trouvé, mais c'est plutôt Malcolm Goldstein qui l'a qui qui trouvé. Fait. Et en fait, c'est le titre d'une euh, chanson euh, folklorique bosniaque. Euh, et euh, et j'étais très impressionné par l'histoire qu'il y avait derrière la pièce de musique. C'est-à-dire qu'en 1995, Malcolm... Euh, comme, pour réagir à la guerre euh, en Bosnie-Herzégovine, a décidé de jouer des, des chants folkloriques euh, bosniaques et euh, comme signe d'espoir pour la paix dans ce pays-là. Et, euh, et une de ces pièces-là, parce que son projet inclut des compositions et aussi euh, différents, différents chants folkloriques, euh, dans un album récent euh, qu'il a fait, qu'il m'a qu offert, il y avait cette pièce-là qui durait cinq minutes, et euh, j'avais d'abord essayé de l'utiliser pour le premier projet que j'ai fait avec lui, mais ça, la structure de la pièce ne convenait pas, et je, ça m'est resté dans la tête. Et, euh, et moi, dans cette période-là, sur à peu près trois ans, j'ai essayé d'organiser un retour à la gravure sur pellicule à travers une série d'exercices, de, on peut dire, ou de, de passages obligés pour revisiter cette technique-là parce que je ne voulais pas simplement reprendre où j'avais laissé en 1999. Alors, euh, il y a eu bon, des, 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 exercices, des exercices qui ont donné des, euh, des gifs sur Facebook, il y a eu des performances, il y a eu une installation vidéo, un premier film. Et là, avec ce film-là, j'avais l'impression d'arriver au bout du processus initial de réintégration dans la gravure sur pellicule. Et la pièce de Malcolm me semblait tout à fait appropriée pour faire quelque chose qui n'était qui était pas seulement basé sur des petits segments euh, que, où j'explorais des, des façons de créer des, euh, des polyphonies de clignotement, 
Euh, dans ce cas-là, ça me semblait donner la possibilité d'une chose plus prosodique qui allait se dérouler sur euh, plusieurs minutes et non pas un, une combinaison de, de petits segments euh, comme j'avais fait pour le film précédent. Alors, euh, alors comme il y a quelque chose quand même d'assez lyrique dans cette pièce, euh, je me suis engagé dedans et j'ai fait quelque chose que j'avais toujours refusé de faire, c'est-à-dire une analyse très, très détaillée, très précise de, de la musique. Euh, J'avais toujours résisté à ça parce qu'il m'avait toujours semblé que le temps s'écoulait en musique d'une façon totalement différente de, de, dans, avec les images vous mouvantes. Avez, vous n'avez jamais cherché à, mmh. à synchroniser l'image? Non, j'avais même une sorte de, 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 re, de, ref, de, de refus <rire> de faire ça, puis de, de créer plutôt des, des relations à distance. Euh, et dans ce cas-là... Euh, la, la nature de ce que je cherchais avec ce, ce, ce système de polyphonie glottement en gravure sur pellicule et la, la structure, la microstructure extrêmement complexe du jeu euh, de Malcolm au violon me semblait justifier de tout à coup faire ce que j'avais jamais voulu faire et sans que ça représente un aplatissement de, des relations ou quelque chose de trop en surface. Euh, au contraire, ça m'a semblé être, euh, être une, une approche qui, qui, était, euh, très, euh, qui était très porteuse et, et qui me menait en fait au-delà de ce que j'aurais fait sans m'être donné cette, cette contrainte qui, qui pour moi était un peu contre nature. Question de la salle pour, pour Pierre Hébert. Oui, au fond, tout au fond. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the technique apart from the scratching on film? Is there, are, you, are you layering things? Is there a digital process? Y yes, uh, uh, of course, you know, initially uh, in the uh, 90s and 80s when I was using uh, scratching on film, I, I was actually layering, layering things, but I was using the optical camera, which was a, a, a totally different process. Uh, but, of course, the, the reason why I dropped uh, scratching on film from 2000 to uh, two years ago was because I started to work with digital technology. And, uh, and th the fact that I was returning to uh, scratching on film didn't mean that I was rejecting uh, this period of uh, digital uh, technology. On Quite the contrary, actually. So, so actually, I've been using uh, all the possibilities of digital composition instead of the uh, optical printer. And of course, it, it, allow, it allows much more. So uh, the initial work was scratching on 35 uh, millimeter, millimeter film. But right away, I was uh, digitizing uh, the images uh, in, at a very high, uh, in very high quality digitizing and they were about you know 4000 pixel wide and then from then on the composition and the work on the film was all done uh, digitally which seemed to me the proper thing to do i don't see a reason why to stay in that process with the uh, the Ar argentic uh, technology and pr and there was no reason to have a real 35 millimeter film uh, at the end of the process Uh, the way my film are being shown, and you know, it's it anyway, and it, the, it really was the proper thing to go through this uh, digital process. And of course, I had like 15 years of experience of uh, doing that, so I, I felt actually much more at ease doing it digitally than uh, going back to uh, the optical printer. And actually, optical printers are now extremely difficult to find. Uh, <laughs> These days, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, the, 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 it's uh, it's a mixture of the two, of the, yeah. Thank you very much, Pierre. Merci beaucoup, Pierre mon plaisir. Merci beaucoup, Marcel. And now, please welcome the director of pattern cognition, Thorsten Fleisch. Hello, Thorsten. Bonjour. Thorsten, I, I know and appreciate your, your work since a long time, and I was at the same time surprised and happy to discover that you made a flick of film. Yeah. Surprised <laughs> because we, 
we saw so many Flickr films through the history of experimental film and happy because you did something new. So tell us about your process for, for this film, please. Um, for this film, <coughs> so the um, source material is all digital photography, which I then um, processed further and further to, to um, that they become more and more abstract. So I wanted the most abstract starting point in a way, and then start to find patterns within it and loop it and add it on, on different kind of micro levels and um, then have different themes and edit them. And yeah, experimented with the speed of it and yeah, <laughs> and the effect, the, the physical effect also. The physical effect, yeah. You, you made a film all by yourself, even even the sound. So yes, uh, how did you generate the sound? The sound um, I made on my iPad um, with some software and um, kind of side by side. So um, I had some chunks of sounds that I liked and um, was using them after after I had the edit, but um, more casual on the side. Yeah. The there is a there is a real evolution in the film, uh, so I, I would like to know uh, what kind of of map of the film you have at the beginning. Do you uh, do you map it in in color, in feeling, in intensity? Uh, how how? Does it like uh, a plan or a script or, or, or something for a film like this one? Um, so it's, um, I don't have the ending in mind at the beginning. So I, I started with this more um, kind of global macro approach a little bit, but then it developed into this, um, that I go deeper into the, um, not really the pixels, but into the uh, individual colors. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I don't know, I found this during the film and then um, saw the possibility of this little bit of a dramatic arc to, to, to come from the, from the macro into the, into the atomistic almost, where it's just about the colors and the flashes and uh, yeah, work with that. But I was very happy about uh, that this happened. So yeah, the, the arc is, is yeah. uh, very efficient. I, I yeah, I thanks. <laughs> Question from for uh, from the audience. Sorry, uh, for Torsten Fleisch. Yes, stomach. No. Okay. You. There is a very simple credit at the end of the film. So, did did you uh, look for funding or found some? No, not not with this. I had another project which was more. Um, classical animation with a story and with a kind of um, collage cutout technique where I didn't get the funding so I was a bit like yeah you know I, I go ahead uh, on my own again and do my more radical stuff and yeah maybe for another project I don't know but uh, I don't know I'm not so happy with this whole funding things where you start a long process and then wait for a result and then don't get it anyway <laughs> yep uh, I have a couple of questions, and uh, I will try to be short. Like, do you do you watch such abstract movies by yourself, or you're like uh, as a uh, as a viewer? And uh, second question is like, how how do you like? As it was mentioned, there is like many such kind of mm, flickering, mm, noisy movies. So how do you you feel? Like, do you do you compare yourself to other such kind of movies, and how yours is different or not different? And like, do you? And third question is, do you listen to noise music? And it, this is kind of, for me, it's kind of visual visual version of noise music, like Merzbo or something. Uh, yeah. Um, so I. Um, 
Um, I would say when I was younger, I was watching more of this stuff. Recently, I'm, uh, I don't know, I don't watch so many things, um, but I'm very aware of uh, all this, um, the, the genre for one, and also the noise genre. So I, I've been to a noise concert every once in a while, but I don't, I'm not like a super uh, geek for it or something. It's, I'm, I'm aware of it, I like it, it's um, something that caters to my taste, but uh, not like all the time or, yeah, but in general. I don't know, what I like about it is that it's uh, the, the physical intensity, which is uh, something very unique about the flicker and also the noise music. It's, it's hard to escape it, and, but still there, still you can work with it, still you can, um, or you have to, to, um, to do something interesting with it. I don't know, so, yeah. <laughs> Another question? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. And now, please welcome the director of Matter and Motion, Max Atler. Hello, Max. Hello. Max, you're, you're based in Hong Kong, and there is many animators slash collaborators uh, in the end credits of your film. I count 27 to be precise, I think. Uh, so how cool the film was made with so many collaborators? Um, <coughs> so yeah, so I'm, I'm in Hong Kong and I teach there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do projects with my students um, in, in, the, in the classroom as a kind of uh, way for them to learn animation and for me to have an army of, uh, someone said a Chinese army, <laughs> uh, to, to help me make a new film. Um, so yeah, this film was made very quickly, um, uh, ki kind of as, a, as an exercise of sorts, but then I'm directing and, and so I, I kind of keep control of, of it, but at the same time it's um, also quite open because working with abstract um, so, sorry, but what do you mean by very quickly? When um, this was done in, I don't know, like in a month. In a month? Yeah. Okay. And you say, okay, you have all, you have this orchestra. It's uh, the, the way you describe this, it's like you are uh, the maestro or the, 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 the chef, and you, you have an orchestra of collaborators who, who work with you. Is, is it like that? So. Um, I mean, the, the thing is that with my work, I'd, it's it's usually kind of improvised. I, mm -hmm. I don't script. I, uh, um, in this case, the music came first. I, 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 you know, you work to the sound, and if I was doing it myself, I kind of you know set some ground rules and I start start somewhere and then you develop. And so, in a way, it's the same process, except you kind of farm it out to different people and you say, okay, start somewhere, do something. I give you feedback, and then. Y you know, so the process is quite similar to me doing it myself, except I don't have complete control, but at the same time, it's an exploratory process, which whether I do it or someone else does it, if I can, if I can direct and keep control, then it's, it can work, it doesn't always work. Okay, and, and the, your students, they did different parts of the film or? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so everyone did maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds or something. And then, um, you know, it was put together and I, I, I did some revisions at the end. Because it, it's very surprising because it, it looked quite coherent. <coughs> um, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's always the, the tricky part, that's to, the tricky to, part? To, to hold it together. Yeah. yeah. But for a short piece like this, it... it <coughs> sorry. Um, for a short piece like this, it can work. If it's, if it's longer, then it's it usually doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Questions? From the audience for Max Hatler. I have one. You you submit more. <laughs> you you submitted more than one film this year. So the and and I think it you submitted three if I remember well. You don't remember. Okay, and uh, they were quite different. 
and and we I remember that we said okay we will select one of the film but we it it was hard to pick because the three three of them worked very well and were different so they were all made with the same kind of process or Um, so, uh, probably we, uh, we s I, I, I sent you uh, a film called Plus, which is um, kind of like a little bit like a flicker kind of noise yeah. film, uh, which is, um, um, it's a generif generative process behind it. It's actually the system I use for my live performances, and it's kind of almost like a recording of a live performance that a performance that's then edited. Um, and then I probably send you uh, divisional articulations, which is um, a, a music video uses uses kind of video feedback and and um, kind of <laughs> geometric <laughs> shapes. Geometric yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, divisional articulations is made in this in in the same way, also with a team of students, um, <coughs> with um, more uh, kind of reworking uh, afterwards, quite quite a lot. So yeah, so those are quite similar. Thank you very much, Max Hatler. Thank you. And now please welcome the director of A Year Along the Geostationary Orbit, Felix Dirich. Bonjour. Good morning, Felix. Do you want to speak in English or in French? Uh, English is better. English, yeah, yep. Pa pardon my French. <laughs> <laughs> Felix, you <laughs> received the Video Staff Pick Award yesterday. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks a lot, yeah. Was that a surprise for you that uh, Vimeo, uh, uh, an online platform, uh, awarded a film like yours that is quite long mm. for... Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. So uh, how did you receive it? Apart, uh, you were probably happy with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it was it was really big surprise for me because I'm not sure how it's going to work on the internet. So the film is definitely something where you need to um, kind of take the time to get drawn into it, and it works, of course, particularly well on the big screen and uh, with nice round sound and so on. Um, but I think the people that watch uh, the Vimeo Staff Pick um, films uh, and award, yeah, and um, that those are probably also um, not the ones that watch funny stuff on YouTube all the time, you know? And so it's probably, uh, I hope it's gonna work. And what uh, Jeff from Vimeo also said is that it might actually be very interesting for the people that are, have a general interest in science and, you know, maybe uh, create a uh, more interest there and some, yeah. Uh, so of course there's m different layers to see the film and, there's, and the, um, you can see it from a scientific point of view or a meteorological point of view. And uh, then, yeah, so there's probably also different audiences in the end for that. So we'll, we'll see. I'm very curious how, to, how it's going to work. So it's going online um, this afternoon sometime. And then, yeah. <coughs> did, you, did you add the intent to say something about the ecology when, y when you did the film? Uh, yes, but I didn't want to do uh, like a classical documentary with a voiceover saying, uh, look at this and the climate <coughs> is being messed up or something. Because also, I don't, without being an expert, I, I guess, I, I'm not even sure if you can see it from the film. I mean, there's a lot of huge typhoons uh, and in the film in that year, but uh, um, I would not say it. But on the other hand, if you just deal with the topic, if you see how weather works, how the earth, uh, so how, how weather actually uh, is created near the equator and then goes up and north and down south and so on, there might be some, you know, just recognition and some, you know, uh, awareness, raise some more awareness for the earth. And uh, um, so it, it's, I, I hope it's going to be um, somewhat inspiring and somewhat uh, maybe uh, 
interesting for the topic of, of con conserving the uh, the earth and it's been running quite well at e environmental film festivals as well yeah. so it's been recognized as that and like I said it, 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 it was my intention just to 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 see how it works to, to really have it as an experiment and see uh, how it works on people and how people react on it and not try to push it in a certain direction or push people into a certain direction could could you say a few words about the process of editing it, the the, mm. the way you choose every image? Or yeah, it's uh, so. What uh, maybe I should also mention is that uh, people sometimes think that the the satellite works like a camera, and that's not the case. So what I got was was data files, like huge amounts of numbers, so to say. Uh, it was five terabytes compressed data and uh, took months to download it all <laughs> and uh, uh, and then you you have to recreate images from it so um, okay. first uh, so of course everybody knows satellite images from television there's different ways to recreate it most of the time it's actually just the clouds which are real satellite image and the rest is a, is a color map but in this case it's actually 100 percent the, the the radiation scans from the satellite and that's also why there's so little green in the film um, because the satellite is kind of green blind a little bit, it's so it only has a small part of the green spectrum. Um, so the first step basically was to make images out of this data again. And uh, so uh, at, at in the nighttime, the, the visible light is completely black because it doesn't have any exposure control. So you don't see cities or anything. Uh, so in the nighttime, it's using infrared. And so I've, I've, I wrote an algorithm to, to recreate these images. Um, which is probably inferior to what the me meteorological services do, but they have a big staff and years of experience, of course. Uh, and then I had these 50,000 images, which were all uh, 5,500 by 5,500 pixels, so massive amounts of data. And then I tried to, then I, I had to find some ways to edit that in, in compositing. And then I actually, um, I created this path, so uh, across the earth through the, throughout the year. and had a look at what interesting meteorological events and uh, astro astronomical events sorry, uh, are happening within the year. And um, so this, this path was cr uh, created then in compositing by, by trying out. So uh, in, uh, the film was in general a very experimental approach. So mm -hmm. there was no script or no real plan in the beginning. <coughs> Questions from the audience for Felix? Thank you very much, Felix. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Losing my money. Well, uh, please welcome Tara Knight, director of Unsettled. Hello, Tara. Hello. Hello. Tara, every time I watch your film, I have the strong impression it was done to be shown in a museum more than a theater. Is that? It was designed ideally to be shown in both, but obviously on repeat viewing, you see other things within the film. Um, and I intentionally made a looping version without the credits or titles that can kind of show in a gallery context on a loop. Um, and it showed, it showed in London and a few other places that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the film was made uh, in, in, in your base in Vermont, I think. I, I'm from Vermont. I, I live You're somewhere else Vermont. now, but that's where I grew up, yes. Yeah. Okay. Vermont is in between Quebec and New York City, for people who may <laughs> not know this very small part of the world. <laughs> yep. Bernie Sanders. <laughs> okay, so tell us about your original goal with, mm -hmm. with this project. Yeah, so Vermont is known, especially in the American imagination, as this kind of beautific, quaint, people want to retire there, um, kind of this imaginary place. And so when people come to Vermont, um, they look at the landscape, they say, oh, it's so beautiful. It's and the green state. It's I the green yeah. state. It's Vermont, yes. <laughs> so, but I, having grown up there and having grown up in a working class, poor part of the state, when I see the landscape, I see something very different. So this, for me, was a way to kind of reveal aspects of the landscape of, uh, I'm not sure how well it re reads to an international audience, but certainly for uh, an American audience, 
certain aspects of poverty or the heroin crisis, definitely read immediately, even though you only see flashes of it. Yeah, so for me it was how I see the landscape of my own, where I grew up. Tell us about your, your background as an artist, please. Uh, if you can, uh, maybe you can tell from this, but my first job was as an optical printer, speaking of <laughs> optical printing. So I think that shows in this film. I also worked on um, the hand-painted films of Faith Hubley and Emily Hubley at different points in my career. And then I also work in live performance. Someone was talking about kind of live generative work. I also work with dancers. I also work in virtual reality. Actually, my VR project is um, just premiered the same day as the film here in Belgium at an astrophysics conference. So my team was there, but I couldn't be there. How did you pick the title of the film? Unsettled, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope it has uh, several different meanings. One being like the settling of a landscape and it never being quite settled. Um, another meaning being that there's kind of uh, European colonization of settling the, the new world, mm -hmm. that of kind of undoing some of that or revealing some of that settling that, I, I can't get this, this film programmed in the United States, like no one will take <laughs> it. Every place else shows it, in part because it's so critical of American history and we Americans are not known for our self-reflection so mm -hmm. much on our own history. Um, so it was really an attempt to kind of take what is often seen as a fixed landscape and um, unsettle it a little, a little bit. Okay. Questions from the audience for uh, Tarak. Well, okay. thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Alors voilà ce qui termine euh, les petits déj du cours pour cette édition 2019 euh, du festival. Merci à tous, c'est un plaisir de vous rencontrer et je vous souhaite une bonne fin de festival. Thank you.